All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Church of the Nazarene. So wonderful to see you here this morning. Let's stand and worship with Blessed Be Your Name. say blessed be the name of the Lord. And Father, as we do that, as we acknowledge who you are and our humanness and our need for you, our hearts are calm. As we accept, as we grow in our relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, very glad that you're here this morning, and we do have a, a number of announcements and several that came to me right as I came up here, so if I forget one, I'm sorry. Everything is in the bulletin, though, I think. 
First announcement is Crisis Care Kits. We're going to be wrapping this up over the next couple of days. Uh, see Wayne if you've got any questions uh, in the foyer after the service. Uh, again, Crisis Care Kits we put together. Whenever there's a crisis around the world, we'll send uh, this kit that has some bare necessities um, that someone might need if they lost everything. So uh, soap and shampoo and uh, fingernail clippers. And we put a little stuffed animal on there just as an encouragement for little kids to, uh, to cling to in the case of a, of a crisis. So uh, if you've got questions, see Wayne on that. And as we've said before, we have to be very specific with these items because we have to send them through customs. And so we have to put exactly in them what is, what is supposed to be in them. Um, Alabaster offering today. Uh, we have a video here in just a moment that we'll watch. Uh, but we are going to uh, take our alabaster offering today. You can put a check in the offering if you like, or there's a, a church house out in the foyer if you'd like to bring your change and put your change in that. Um, men's breakfast this coming Saturday. There will be a men's uh, breakfast at 7.30. And so if you're interested, see Pastor Larry with any questions. In the bulletin, you'll see that we're approaching the Easter season, which means that we're collecting candy. Um, so... It, the details are in the bulletin. We've got a bunch of eggs, but we need free wrapped candy that we can put in the uh, Easter eggs for the kids for their Easter egg hunt. And then um, small group for the young adults will be this Thursday night at Jimmy and Leah's house. And then Amy has an announcement about trivia, and then we'll talk about alabaster. We're getting so excited for our second annual trivia night. It's going to be on Friday, April 8th. We're going to have the doors open at 6.30 and then trivia at 7.00. We had an awesome time last year, raised a lot of money that went towards the really comfortable black chairs that we have now. So save the date. If you've got any questions, come see me. All right, and now we have a video on alabaster. Just imagine a world where pastors and missionaries have a place to live. Students have a place to study. Families have a place to receive health care. And everyone has a place to learn about Jesus Christ. You have been a part of making this dream come true for people in need all over the world. The Nazarene Missions International Alabaster Offerings have raised over $100 million to fund building projects that have impacted countless lives. Certainly, a community is more than its buildings, but Alabaster projects help empower people by providing spaces to gather, learn, and live life together as a church. These permanent structures are a reminder to the community that the church isn't leaving. Give through the Alabaster offering this year and help build a better future as God works in building projects across the globe. All right, last week I mentioned that I thought we'd raised about $48 million. It was 1948 that we started, which is where the 48 came from. But it's over $100 million that we've raised as a denomination across uh, the last many years. And uh, so I encourage you to continue to participate in that. Well, this... Uh, this sermon series that we're in right now is a sermon series on spiritual formation. And we're talking about uh, what does it mean for us to live as uh, disciples of Jesus Christ, and not just in the big concepts that I tend to like talking, but in the practical, how do we do that? So three weeks ago, the last time that I preached, which has been kind of crazy with, uh, with the snowstorm and then having a guest speaker last week, three weeks ago, we talked about meditating on Scripture. And allowing ourselves to, to not just read or hear scripture, but to meditate on it, to allow it to sink in. And so this morning, I want us to practice that again. And we're going to read today's psalm, which is Psalm 28. Now, when we look at the psalms, when we look at um, the, the scriptures, um, especially the psalms, they're very honest in emotion. Sometimes what the psalmist says I think, man, back off, cool off. You're just kind of being too crazy right now. But the truth is that he's being very raw with his emotions. And in today's psalm, there's, one, some of the, there's a section in the middle where we see the psalmist is pretty angry about something. He's, he's frustrated with injustice. He's frustrated that the wicked are prospering. And so we'll see that raw anger. 
come out. But in the end, he comes back to this understanding that it really is about God being who God is. And so let's read together from Psalm 28. I pray to you, O Lord, my rock, do not turn a deaf ear to me. For if you were silent, I might as well give up and die. You ever feel like that? Listen to my prayer for mercy as I cry out to you for help. As I lift my hands toward your holy sanctuary, do not drag me away with the wicked, with those who do evil, those who speak friendly words to their neighbors while planning evil in their hearts. Give them the punishment they so richly deserve. Measure it out in proportion to their wickedness. Pay them back for all their evil deeds. Give them a taste of what they have done to others. They care nothing for what the Lord has done or for what his hands have made. So he will tear them down and they will never be rebuilt. Praise the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. I trust him with all my heart. He helps me, and my heart is filled with joy. I burst out in songs of thanksgiving. The Lord gives his people strength, and he is a safe fortress for his anointed king. Save your people. Bless Israel, your special possession. Lead them like a shepherd, and carry them in your arms forever. I want us to read through that one more time. And Kathleen, if you want to go ahead and kind of just play softly. I want you to, to allow these words to kind of sink in. I pray to you, O Lord, my rock. Do not turn a deaf ear to me. For if you were silent, I might as well give up and die. Listen to my prayer for mercy as I cry out to you for help. As I lift my hand toward your holy sanctuary, do not drag me away with the wicked, with those who do evil, with those who speak friendly words to their neighbors while planning evil in their hearts. Give them the punishment they so richly deserve. Measure it out in proportion to their wickedness. Pay them back for all their evil deeds. Give them a taste of what they have done to others. They care for what they care nothing for what the Lord has done, for what his hands have made. So he will tear them down and they will never be rebuilt. Praise the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength. I trust him with all my heart. He helps me and my heart is filled with joy. I burst out in songs of thanksgiving. The Lord gives his people strength. He is a safe fortress for his anointed king. Save your people. Bless Israel, your special possession. Lead them like a shepherd. And carry them in your arms forever. Let's stand together and allow those words to illuminate. That the Lord would lead us like a shepherd. And carry us in his arms forever. Your love is amazing. Steady.
of the amazing things about our relationship with God is it's not just that, that we get to call out to God, but it's also that God says, I want to speak with you and I want to use you. I, I want to do things in your life. And I want to do things in this world through you. And sometimes we get so caught up in the everything else going on in life that we miss that that we miss the fact that, that God has designed us, created us in His image, that we are to represent Him to the world around us. So when we sing songs like this, come Lord Jesus, come, it's not that we're, we're saying He's not here until we ask Him to come, but it's saying, Lord, come through me and use me, do something in me that allows me to make a difference in this world not just on my own ability, because I, I think it's definitely where I can fall to, but that God would use us to make a difference in the world around us as an overflow of who He is in us. As we approach this time of prayer this morning, I, I don't know exactly where you're at. I know we all come into this place every week, and as I stand and I gaze out at the faces that and I see some who are struggling in this area and some who are, who are probably wrestling with some pretty big issues here and, and, and big concerns and the realities of life and relationships. I'm not exactly sure where you're at this morning, but I do know that when we come to this place, that God wants to speak to each one of us. Some of us this morning may need this word of, of encouragement that you're going to make it just keep holding on. Some of us this morning probably need this word of, of hey, get off your tail and do something. And some of us this morning may need the word of, of be still and know that I'm God. And I don't try to say that I know where you're at because I don't. But I do know that our God is big enough to speak to each one of us wherever we're at. So as we sing through this chorus again, I, I encourage you just to quiet your heart and say, God, what do you want to speak to me this morning? If you want to come forward, our altars are open. If you want to be seated, if you want to remain standing, whatever allows you to, to quiet your heart and focus on you. But allow him to speak to us so that he truly can come and impact the world through us. Come. seek to make your will and your way known to us. Father, this morning as we gather into this place, I pray that you will help us to listen. That we'll not be so concerned with getting our peace in, but that we will hear what you would say to us. So we take a moment just to silently listen. Father, there's so many areas that we 
struggle as we walk this journey of life. This morning as we gather in this place, I know that there are many who are struggling in relationships. Father, we lift those to you this morning. We ask that you will speak to us. We ask that you will speak to those that we struggle with. Help us to see our need for a healer and how best to communicate. Father, for those who are here this morning who are, who are struggling in their financial situation, I pray, I pray that you will surround them with your presence, and that you will meet the needs in a way that shows us that it truly is you. Father, for those this morning who are struggling with health concerns, we lift them to you and ask, Father, that you would truly be the great, great physician that we know you are, that you will speak to the health concerns, that you will speak to our hearts in the process. Father, for those who are struggling in their jobs, we pray that you will speak to a word of guidance. up to you as we seek to know you. I pray that you will speak to our hearts the message that we need to hear. That we will not be concerned with the people who are around us. That we will not be concerned with what others think, but that we will truly hear from you and what you want to speak to us. And I pray that we'll be obedient to what you speak to us. Father, so many times in this life, in this world, we feel overwhelmed. There's times when we don't know what to say. There's times when words are just circling in our heads so fast that we can't get them to slow down. But in times such as these, we find great comfort and great joy in praying together the prayer that your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
continue to worship with Lord have mercy. Jesus, I forgot to the words that you have spoken. Promises have burned within. My heart have now grown dim. With a doubting heart I follow the paths of earthly wisdom. Forgive me for my unbelief. Renew Spirit and for our fellowship together. Thank you for all that you do for everyone in this world every day and every way. Please bless our offering this morning for all power, honor, praise, and glory is yours forever. Amen.
thank you to our worship team for a wonderful job this morning. Well, this week we are continuing our series on spiritual formation. And as I've uh, worked to prepare this week, I've kind of gone back and forth um, in, in the order of a couple of messages. But this morning I want us to look at spiritual formation and the role that the church plays in spiritual formation. And I think that so often in our, in our lives, in our busyness, in the craziness of the world that we live in, that church can very easily become just something that we do, but we miss out on the purpose of church, and we don't allow God to use it to shape us in such a way because we're unfortunately becoming consumers of church. When I say that we're consumers, I, I think that, that in our cult, church culture, it's very easy for us to try to play these, these games, the marketing games, similar to the marketing games that restaurants or other businesses try to play. We want your business, in other words. And we're so consumed with wanting your business as churches, we're so consumed with wanting our seats to be full that we miss that role, that sacred role of the church in forming us, in helping us to become true disciples of Jesus Christ. And so I want us to, to look at this a little bit this morning in light of several of the, the spiritual disciplines, and we'll talk briefly through those. There's not time to give adequate attention, uh, but hopefully we'll, we'll, uh, we'll cover them at least to some degree. But before we get started, I want to start with a few disclaimers. First of all, being a disciple of Jesus Christ does not come naturally to me, as I don't think it comes naturally to any of us. We have our own um, stubborn streaks. We have our own selfishness that makes us not really want to give in to being a disciple. I, I've caught myself multiple times as I've worked on this series just wanting to go back to this, just let me tell people what to do instead of help me learn how to be myself and then model that and we together walk as disciples. It's not a natural thing for me or for any of us. And I want to say that I'm not an expert especially the topic today that, that we're talking about, because if you go into my office, there's, a, there's an entire shelf of books on the church. And there's a lot of different opinions that I've studied over the years, and, and lots of books about how to do church, and, and how, to, how to get the seats full. But I've wrestled with that. And in the last two years in particular, I've wrestled with wait a second, that's not really making disciples. That's just getting your church to grow to look good, but not to help us to become what we're supposed to become. And so I, I give this disclaimer at the beginning of this service. I'm not an expert on this. I'm a fellow student when it comes to this. My tendency, um, based on my personality, is to just switch into this doing discipleship mode, which cares nothing for what takes place on the inside. It just gets stuff done. And I've, I've fought this battle all week, actually for the last three weeks as I've been in this series. I just want to do instead of allowing God to help me to be. But I sense God's leading in this series. For my own personal growth, as well as for us as a congregation, even though it's uncomfortable for me, and my guess is that this is not the most comfortable sermon for some of you either. But misery loves company, right? Our mission as a church, it's on the front of our bulletin, it's, it's, it's on the side of our vans, it's, it's what we say that we're about, is training disciples who passionately seek God. And I, I've focused for most of my ministry here on this training disciples piece. But I feel like God is calling me to come back to say, but what does it mean to not just train disciples, but to be 
a disciple who passionately seeks after God. It's not just getting stuff done, which is the way that I tend to view the world. It's not just crossing things off the checklist. It's not just saying, well, this is a success. It's saying, what does it mean for me to passionately seek God? And what does it mean for us as a congregation to passionately seek God together? There are four components, I believe, to discipleship, and these are my big topics that God is telling me to stop being so heady about. First of all, there's the personal relationship with Jesus Christ. There is the need to live in biblical community. There is regularly engaging God's Word, and not just reading it so I've checked it off my list, but truly engaging God's Word and hearing from God through His Word. And then living a life of service to others. But living that life as an overflow of what God is doing in me instead of it just being, well, I did this, 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 and this. Sometimes, especially for me, it's easy to talk the big concepts and ignore the practical. So what does it mean for us to passionately seek God? What does it mean for us to live in personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not just a phrase. There's, there's, a, there's a concept here that sometimes for me it's easy to ignore. What does it mean for us to live in biblical community together? What does it mean for us to, to engage God's Word? What does it mean to live a life of service? Not just on the big level. But what does it mean in here personally? Three weeks ago, we looked at the concept of meditation and, and not an Eastern philosophy of meditation that says I empty myself, but a, a biblical model of meditation which says that I fill myself with God's Word. And this week, I want us to look at the role of the church as a crucial part of our spiritual formation. Now, I, I, as I've said before, there's this entertainment concept or this consumer concept within the church. And it's really in conflict with church as spiritual formation versus entertainment or consumerism. What I mean by that, when we look at church as entertainment, now we're blessed as a church and we've got pretty good worship here. I, I'm very thankful for that. But when it comes to church as entertainment, you can turn on the TV and find a much better speaker. You can flip through the channels, and when he says something you don't like, you can just tune it out and switch to another station. When he makes those jokes about Iowa or the Cubs or the Bears, you can enough of that. But when church is not about entertainment, when it really is about spiritual formation, there's something to be said for setting through those bad jokes about my team. There's something to be said for it's not just about gathering in this place to check this off my list, but but what is God speaking to me and what is God wanting to do through me and in me as we come to this place? Now, I have to start with the reality that church is messed up sometimes. The reality of imperfections. There is no perfect church. There isn't. And if you think you found one, just by the fact that you showed up, it's not perfect anymore. <laughs> because none of us are perfect. And an organization cannot be perfect if it is made up of imperfect members. And there is no perfect church. In our entertainment model of church, we, we tend to think that there is a perfect way to do this. But what I've seen as I've studied and as, as I've stepped back from my studies and looked at the papers I've written and looked at my own leadership and my own perspectives from a different view, I see, you know what? What we have tried to do in making the church an entertainment system is that we've taken all the spiritual formation out of it. 
We've taken everything out of church that allows it to change us, to transform us, to help us to be passionate disciples for Jesus Christ. And instead, we've just created another channel on the TV as if we didn't have enough. The church is imperfect because humans are involved. And I think that a part of what we have to accept and a part of what we have to wrestle with is that it's going to be imperfect. But that's okay because it's important for us to have humans involved. I've heard a number of my pastor friends, especially as they age and, and, and get closer to retirement, say, you know, I'd love pastoring if it weren't for the people. And I've heard my teacher friends say, you know, I'd love teaching if it weren't for the students. I've heard the, the, my friends who work in restaurants say, oh, I'd love working in a restaurant if it weren't for the customers. You see, we enjoy the work we do, we just really get annoyed with one another. But the reality of life is that it's not just about me. It's about learning to live as we. It's about learning to put up with whatever your job is, whatever your role. It's learning to put up with the people that really get on your nerves. And sometimes, having to love them even when they get on your nerves. But imperfection does not mean that church is unnecessary. And I think that one of the things that we've seen happen in our church culture in the last 20 years in particular is that church has become less and less essential to us. It's less and less important because of that imperfection. I had a conversation this week with one of my former prisoners from Nebraska, and as we were talking through the the church situation there and some of the things that he was struggling with. And and I said, you know, Merlin, I I said so many times when I was there, and I, I feel it even stronger now, there's so many people who do not go to church, not because they don't have a desire to know God, but because they are so frustrated with the people in the church. And I've gone through times in my own life where I've just been really frustrated with people, not since I've been pastoring, but before I was a pastor. I get so frustrated with the people around me or I get frustrated with the pastor. I haven't been frustrated with my own pastor for nine years at least. (laughs) It's easy to get so frustrated with somebody that we use that as an excuse to disengage. And we use that as an opportunity to complain rather than allow the the spiritual formation to take place, which really is the purpose of church. The purpose of church is not to have good music and a good speaker and get done by noon. It's not the purpose. The purpose of church is to come together and to allow God to transform us through what we do. And there are a number of things that we do as a church. One of the things that we do is worship. And I want to make clear up front that worship is not just something that takes place here every Sunday at 10.30. Worship is a lifestyle. It's, worship is being able to embrace wherever we're at the opportunity to worship who our God is. Worship is the opportunity to be driving down the road and look up and see a bald eagle soaring gracefully and be able to just, wow God, that is awesome. Worship is the opportunity to to be at a family gathering and and to see all the craziness of the little kids running around and just say, wow, God, isn't this awesome? For, you know, five seconds before everybody starts fighting again. But (laughs) worship is the ability to be able to be in your job doing what you do and just feel that great sense of accomplishment that, wow, God, you created me to do this. And worship is also the The lifestyle that says, when everything is going wrong and I don't feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, 
And I was, wanted to look at that eagle before some big semi pulled right in front of me and I can't see anything. And the kids really are fighting like crazy. And to be able to say, in the midst of all that chaos, wow, God, you're still God even in the midst of all this. There's a sense of worship as a lifestyle that's not just about what we do here as a church. But there's also a very real sense that, that church, the worship is a part of what we do in a corporate experience here together. Now, we talked about meditation a couple of weeks ago, and, and I, I thoroughly enjoy and I find great, um, great comfort, and I, I really sense the intimacy with God when I can just close the doors of my office and turn the, the music up loud and, and just enjoy that experience. But there's also something very unique that happens when we come together as a congregation and when we have the opportunity to worship God. There's something different. There's something very sacred. When we worship together, and it doesn't matter what style of music we use, I wanted to show you a video clip of just kind of a, a history of worship in the church. Unfortunately, it was about 15 minutes long, and I knew I'd be too long-winded too, so I couldn't do both. But when you think about how worship has changed in the church, starting in the Old Testament and the way that worship was conducted through the New Testament and in through the early church where it started out really as chants, we would chant, and then moving into more of the, the music. I learned something in this video clip that, that music, Christian music, prior to the 15, 1600s, was all composed in a minor key. Because they thought that the minor key would remind us that there's something sacred about God that is not experienced in just the everyday life. And, and when we go in the major key, they thought it would, it would make us feel more secular. So all the Christian music was composed in the minor key. Now, don't ask me what the minor key is, but I could hear the guy playing it in the video and it sounded different. Um, And then we see the composers, Bach and Handel, as they composed their music and really for the glory of God that was used in worship. As we see the development of the hymn in the 1700s especially, but some going back to the 1500s where, where everybody started singing together. And this video that I was watching was produced, I think, around 2000 and so it was trying to list some of the contemporaries, and yet I think of all the contemporaries that have composed music even in the last 16 years that, that would definitely make this video if it were redone. There's something sacred about worship that takes place together that can't take place just by myself in my car or in my office. Those are important experiences too, but there's something sacred that takes place here when we worship together. And it's not about the style of music because worship can take place whether you're singing music that was written 400 years ago or whether you're singing music that was written last week. We have preferences, but they're all worship. But worship is a part of what we do as a church. And worship is one of those areas where we are formed in our spiritual formation. It's an area where we can let walls down when it comes to listening to music that we don't let down when we're listening to someone speak. In fact, for some of you, you come to church for the music and you endure the sermons. And I'm aware of that and I'm okay with that. Because I trust that God will speak to you through the music and probably in smarter ways or better ways than I could ever communicate. But we let down walls when it comes to music. God speaks to us through music. It gets at our inner core in a way that a spoken word can't or doesn't as easily. But church is not just about worship. Church is also a place for guidance. There's the fellowship of brothers and sisters and the benefit of being able to say, I'm struggling with this. 
can you help me? And to be able to talk to a brother or sister who's, who's been there, or someone who may not have been there, but who can still listen and help you process. And there's a, there's a benefit, a spiritual discipline of guidance that takes place as we are formed and shaped through the guidance of our brothers and sisters in Christ. There's the benefit of godly advice, being able to, to hear well thought out ideas. You know, one of the things that, that I tend to do is I tend to think about things for about two seconds and then act on them. And sometimes I need people, and my wife is great for this, to just say, now Emmanuel, have you thought about it? And just that question, I know the answer. No, I haven't. But just pausing, and then she'll help me to think through the details. Because details to me just, woo <laughs> The benefit of godly advice. It doesn't always come from your pastor. It often comes, in fact, probably more often comes from each other as we go through life. And honestly, a lot of what we see in this area of guidance is examples that we don't want to follow. I can remember a number of examples in my church growing up of, of people who would, who would not just give me good advice about what I should do, but also share the pain of the bad decisions that they had made and how I should not go down that path because here's the story of how it messed my life up. And I think that a part of the guidance that we gain from being together is not just in the good, but it's also in recognizing the bad and the ugly in our lives and being willing to share those experiences with someone else. The study of the Word is another area of spiritual formation. Now, study is its own discipline that takes place and should take place outside of what we do at church. But there's also a sacredness, even though you study outside of church, there's a sacredness in us studying together. There's the regular teaching of the Word. There's looking at the Word, not just through my experiences, but seeing the Word of God explained through other people's experiences. And I hope that there's the constant reminder of the Word when we're together. That we're reminded of the importance of God's Word and one of the things that I try to do is I try to balance my preaching so that I'm not just preaching from the sections of Scripture that I'm comfortable with, but so that we're exposed to the whole of God's Word. From Genesis to Revelations. Even when I would prefer not to preach on Revelation or Job. But to be exposed to all of God's Word, even the parts that are not the most comfortable for us. And, and this can take place in the church through our Sunday school time, through our small groups, through our sermon time, in a way that it doesn't take place when I'm just reading it by myself. Yesterday I was teaching a class here and we were, uh, we were talking about spiritual formation. And I just started with reading to them yesterday's psalm, which was Psalm 27. And there's a point in Psalm 27 where it says... that God is a father to those who have been abandoned by their mother and father. And I was sitting at the table, and I've got a very diverse class this, this, for this course. I have one gentleman from Tojo, Africa. I have one lady from the Philippines. I have another gentleman from Mexico. And I have one, yesterday I had one uh, American. There's two in the class, but one was missing yesterday. And the gentleman from Tojo, he just said, you know, we, you guys talk about your parents a lot, but he said, the truth is I've never met my father. I'm assuming that he was killed in a conflict I don't know. But he said, when, I, when you read that passage of Scripture that spoke to me this morning, that God is the father to those who have been abandoned by their mother and father. Now, the gentleman that he was talking to is the yesterday the one Anglo guy in the room, the one who had been talking about a conversation he'd had with his father, and he just, wow, it's so foreign for me to even understand that concept 
of not having a father because he's been very close to his father. And yet to set to have Jonathan sitting across the room from Yao and to hear from Yao and yeah. Hearing God's word interpreted through other people's lives is something very different from just hearing it through your own mind and your own lens. I interpret scripture differently based on where I've lived. I, it's the same message, but the, the way that it applies sometimes is different. The way that it's lived out. The study of the Word is something that, that we need to not just see things through my lens. And then there's this concept of submission. Now, I know that just the concept of the word submission brings up a lot of bristles and uh, where are you going here, Pastor? But I want us to, to look at submission this way. Submission in the spiritual formation sense starts with the recognition that we are not the only human being on the earth. Sometimes it would be nice, wouldn't it? For some of you with the more uh, introverted personalities, you would like that a whole lot. But submission starts with the recognition that I'm not the only human being on the earth. And that means that I can't always be right. Um, there are other perspectives. Other human beings have different needs and different opinions. And you know what? There are some things which I view and I say, wow, this is really black and white, but there's an awful lot in life that's gray. What color should the car be? What brand should the car be? Man, I can be very opinionated. And I've gone through stages. I can remember when I was growing up, everything was about Ford for me. My brother was a Chevy guy, and I was the Ford guy. Now, the truth is, I've never owned a Ford. When I started driving, I saw, well, I don't. And I don't think my brother ever owned a Chevy. He drove Fords as long as I can remember. But we were so opinionated about it, the opposite. There are a lot of opinions. And opinions go either way. But it's recognizing in submission that I don't have the only opinion. And I think as I've grown, as I've lived and worked in different environments and as I've studied in different environments, one of the amazing things to me is to recognize that many people who have different opinions of me or than I do, when I was growing up, I was taught, well, it's just because they're stupid because that's how we process things in southern Indiana. You disagree with me, you must be stupid. And yet to recognize that even on big issues that I'm very opinionated on still, that other people come at those issues from very different perspectives and it doesn't make them stupid. I still disagree with where they end up, but they get there in such a way that I've got to respect their journey even if I don't respect the decision. Submission as a part of spiritual formation is coming together and recognizing that we don't all like the same things. We don't all view life the same way, and that's okay. Submission recognizes that there is acceptance for the greater good. Submission in life in general applies to us being submitted to the will of God. And that's a, another subject, a different area. But what I'm talking about here today is submission to one another. And Paul talks about this a couple of places, that you would be submitted one to another because we recognize the greater good that is involved. That means that I don't always have to get my way. It means that I don't always get to drive the car, the color of car I want. Or it means that we don't always get the color of carpet that we want in the church. It means that we paint the walls in colors that some people like and some people don't. It means that the style of music some people like is a style of music that some people don't like. But we commit for the greater good to be submitted 
and to not view this as an entertainment and I'll just switch the channel and go to another church, but to say we're in this together. But church also has a unique role as we together celebrate the sacraments. Now the sacraments in their, in their definition, in their intent, is not something that I would just practice on my own. But there's a sacredness in the sacraments that we together come and partake. They're designed for that. My brother and I, when we were young, we would go to the, to the local lake and we would, we would sometimes baptize one another. It was a brotherly way of dunking one another and holding one under. And when mom called us on it, we would say, oh, we're, we're just playing church. <laughs> that wasn't baptism. There's something sacred about baptism when we together come. There's, there's a sacredness to communion. Now, I, I drink, or I eat bread on a regular basis. I sometimes drink grape juice. That, that doesn't make it a sacrament. It's a sacrament when we're together, partaking together. Baptism and communion do not take place outside of a church context. That's in their design, and it keeps us grounded. It keeps us needing one another. I read an interesting quote on communion yesterday. It was written by N.T. Wright, and it said, Theories about how Jesus' death dealt with our sins have come and gone throughout church history. Many of these theories are profoundly moving, drawing together deep spiritual insight, remarkable theological understanding, and a commitment to bring God's saving love to the needy world. Many of them have inspired Christian people with a new view of God's grace and mercy. And theories have their proper place. But they weren't the main thing that Jesus gave his followers. He gave them an act to perform. Specifically, he gave them a meal to share. And it is a meal that speaks more volumes than any theory. Jesus gave them an act to perform. And in that act being performed together, there is sacredness that cannot be found outside of performing that act together. And I think this statement, this concept applies not only to the sacrament of communion, but also to the spiritual discipline of worship. And also to the spiritual discipline of study. And also to the spiritual discipline of guidance. And also to the spiritual gift, discipline of submission. That it's all fine and good for us to talk about it. It's all fine and good for us to have books written about it. But it's another thing to actually do it. Some of the most brilliant minds that I have read on these theories, when I read their autobiographies, I find that they really did not live out what they stated. And I think for a good portion of my life, I was more concerned about the concepts and less concerned about actually living it out in such a way that showed the love of Christ rather than my annoyances with human beings. And so as the worship team comes and as we prepare to receive the elements of communion today, I want us to read from Luke's Gospel. The 22nd chapter, starting with verse 14. Try this again and see if it works. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. And Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. And then he said, take this and share it among yourselves. 
for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and he said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. The sacrament of communion is a sacred thing that takes place. It's a part of spiritual formation as we are reminded of the death and the resurrection of our Lord. As we are reminded of His willing sacrifice for us. As we are reminded that He not only gave His life, but He said, do this and remember. One of the phrases that Luke brings out is it said that Jesus said, I have been very eager to enjoy this meal with you. Now, it wasn't like Jesus hadn't seen them and He was glad they were coming over for dinner. They'd been traveling together almost nonstop for the last three years. They had breakfast together that day. They had lunch together that day. And the day before, they'd had breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Assuming they ate three meals, I don't know. Every meal that they ate, they had together. They were always together. And it wasn't that it, wasn't that it was the meal. It wasn't just the fellowship as it sometimes is for us as we gather around the table with someone we haven't seen for a while. But it was Jesus saying there is a sacredness to us being together for this meal at this time that we didn't experience when we had lunch together today. That we didn't experience when we had breakfast. And likewise, as we gather in this place, there is a sacredness as we partake of these elements together. Now in the Nazarene church, we have what's called an open table, which means that you do not have to be a member to attend, of, to, of, of our church in order to receive the elements. The only requirement is that you have your heart in a right relationship with God. And that is between you and God, and no one in this place will try to judge that. And if you know that there are things in your life that are not right between you and God, this is a great opportunity for you to spend some time in prayer, to confess those sins, to repent, and to ask God's grace and forgiveness to cover those areas in your life. It is in this act of communion that we are reminded to remember. And it is in the eating of this meal together that we are reminded that we are one body with all of our weirdness and uniqueness and differentness we are one body as we gather around one table Heavenly Father I thank you for these elements for the simple reminder of the bread and the cup that remind us of your ultimate sacrifice but also that remind us it's not just in this sacrifice. It's not just in what you did, but it's in your command for us to remember. And not just to talk about remembering, but to do this act of remembrance. And so as we partake of these elements, I pray that you will use them to speak to each of our hearts that we will each experience spiritual formation as we are shaped and formed into your image through this sacred experience together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll ask those who are planning to help serve to come. And the worship team will sing a song for us as we come. We'll ask that you rise and come to the center aisle come forward to receive your elements and then go back along the side aisles and return to your seats. Hold your elements and we will all partake.
This is the body that was torn for us. This is the blood that was spilled. Points to the pain you endured for us. Points to the shame. himself ordained this holy sacrament and he commanded his disciples to partake of the bread and the wine the emblems of his broken body and his shed blood this is his table the feast is for his disciples that all those who have with true repentance forsaken their sins and believed into Christ and the salvation draw near and take these emblems and by faith partake of the life of Jesus Christ to your soul's comfort and joy let us remember that this is the memorial of the death and passion of our Lord, and also a token of his coming again. Let us not forget that we are at one table with the Lord. The body of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is broken for you, take and eat. symbol of the new covenant. Take and drink in remembrance. Heavenly Father, thank you for the church and the responsibilities and the role that you have given it to accomplish in this world. And I pray as we leave this place today, we leave not thinking that that was a good service and I'm entertained that we would understand the responsibility of the church to be a place of spiritual formation and that we would indeed be changed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and close with your presence is heaven.
sacredness of being a part of the body of Christ, each part being equally important, each part having a necessary role, coming together to represent you in this world. And I pray that we will not just be entertained, but that we will indeed be formed and shaped through our time together today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And you are dismissed.